Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third installment of the Philippine Geographical Society's lecture series for this year. Today's topic tackles on a very timely issue on chronic food insecurity, which is defined in the lived experiences of people living in an estuarial community in Manila. I am TJ Cipriano, one of the board members of PGS, and I will be the moderator for this afternoon's session. Before we officially begin our program, um, let me go over some house rules governing this online session. Please be reminded to keep your mics on mute mode to avoid unnecessary background noise. Also, please note that this lecture is being recorded for documentation purposes. We would like to encourage our virtual audience to actively participate in our discussion by typing in your questions, comments, or reactions in the Zoom chat box. These will be addressed during our open forum later. And before we, be, we end our meeting, we'll be taking a good photo. So please be ready to turn on your respective cameras of this activity um, if you can. Thank you very much. Now for our opening remarks, please welcome one of the board members of the Philippine Geographical Society, Professor Darlene Oxenia Gutierrez. Yeah, thank you, TJ. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third PGS lecture series. This is a joint activity of the Philippine Geographical Society and the UP Department of Geography. Through this, we serve to highlight the different research activities done by our fellow geographers and allies in the field. Last year, we've had a total of 14 lectures with topics covering community resilience, LGBT safe spaces, migration, disaster risk reduction, food security, bird ecology, and, ge and geospatial eth ethnography, among others. For this third Philippine Geographical Society lecture series for this year, our invited speaker will give a presentation entitled Charting Subaltern Foodscapes, Situating Hunger in an Estuarial Community. She will draw from her ethnographic work in Baseco Compound, an estuarial community in Manila City, to discourse on the structural forms of marginalization that have defined the relationship of its residents with their environment as they extract food from it. More specifically, the presentation locates the food systems and networks that they have created to address the gap in food sources within their households. On behalf of the Philippine Geographical Society and the UP Department of Geography, it is my honor to welcome everyone. And as always, I hope we have a special afternoon. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mom Dar. I'm sure everybody is excited for this afternoon session. As what we normally do in our lecture series, we did uh, a word cloud of the key words derived from the online registration. Here we see dominant words or entries such as hunger, scars, access, chronic, issue, economic, and negligence. Other interesting words also appeared like necropolitical, centuries, unhealthy, gruesome, and precarious. It will be very interesting to see how these words will play out in this afternoon's talk. Anyway, so to start our discussion, I would like to introduce our speaker. Well, it's a wonderful surprise considering we are mutuals on Twitter. She is an associate professor at the Department of Sociology of the University of Santo Tomas, where she serves as the head of the Social Health Studies Unit of the Research Center for Social Sciences and Education. She is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Social Health, a peer-reviewed open access journal published by USD. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of the Philippines, where she explored food insecurity among older adults in a sub community. As a feminist anthropologist of health and disaster, she has been collaboratively working with urban informal sectors in negotiating with social institutions for inclusive development towards health and climate justice. As a current Global Fellow of Brown University Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies, 
She is engaged in multi-country research projects, exploring humanitarian coordination during periods of disaster. In 2019, she served as the principal investigator for a Philippine government-funded project, which explored the culture of production and consumption of balut in eight provinces in the country. Her most recent publications include edited volumes, Aging in the Global South, Opportunities and Challenges, and Disaster Archipelago, Locating Vulnerability and Resilience in the Philippines, and journal articles exploring folk and culture, intergenerational vulnerability to food insecurity, communicable diseases, and the intersection between health and climate change, which to a certain extent resonates with my current research work as a geographer. To present her lecture entitled Chartings of Outer Foodscapes, Situating Hunger in an, in an Estuarian Community, it's an honor and a privilege to welcome Dr. Maria Carines Alejandria. Thank you, Sir TJ, and thank you, Sir Joseph, for the invitation. Thank you to the entire board of uh, PGS. I remember that the last time I joined a conversation like this uh, was, I think, uh, in Dumaguete, right? When uh, PGS co-sponsored with UGAT for a conference. Um, I think it was about marine, uh, <laughs> charting marine something. So uh, that, was, um, that was an interesting connection that I finally got to interact with uh, geographers. Quite daunting actually to uh, speak to a group of geographers today because um, the, the conception that most of you are dealing with maps um, initially gives uh, any person without knowledge of that uh, some some chill but having um having had the pleasure of meeting uh, sir joseph uh, in several occasions i kind of have, have a shift on how to understand geography so i hope that i get to deliver this lecture in um, in alignment to your expectations okay let me share my screen Oh, I preempted my slide, sorry. Okay, here. So I have um, entitled my presentation as Charting Subaltern Foodscape Situating um, Hunger in an Estuarial Community for several reasons. Um, I did not use the term, uh, I did not use the term um, informal settler for my title, uh, primarily because I'd like to emphasize that the members or the residents of the psycho compound have been, uh, should be considered as subaltern communities. People have been marginalized extensively by our, by our government, by the systems that we have to the point that it feels like when you're there, you are living in a totally different world. And um, I think from the introduction, you were informed that I have done my ethnographic work in Basaiko compound for, um, for the past uh, decade, actually. It's been a decade now. Um, uh, so even during this pandemic, I keep on collaborating with them. Um, quite uh, interestingly, virtually. So um, we do still have research works going on Baseco for this. But anyway, um, I have decided to discuss about foodscapes today, um, primarily because uh, there is a paper that I, will, that I am writing right now and will be releasing very soon uh, on this topic. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to discuss with, with you how I'm envisioning this concept of foodscape in Baseco. Quite, quite an alternate, actually, quite an alternate point of discussion for foodscapes because mostly when we talk about foodscapes, I'm preempting my discussion here, but when we talk about foodscapes, we usually think about how um, people relate to their environment and that environment where that environment where they collect and um, get their food. And most of the time, this is related to, um, this is related to uh, um, agrarian context, but in the recent years, the concept of foodscape has evolved and geography played a big role in the definition of foodscapes, um, uh, zeroing, zeroing in on uh, urban spaces. And so I'd like to toy with that idea today and hopefully we could have a more meaningful conversation about this in a while. So I would like, uh, using that framework, I would like to situate hunger in, um, an, in an estuarial community. And that estuarial community is Basaiko Compound. 
So this is Baseco compound. It wasn't Baseco compound before. Uh, it used to be uh, called Port Area. And this is how it looked like um, in the 19, um, am I right, 1940s? Uh, this was in the 1940s, right? And this is a shipyard. And um, this is the place. I want you to take note of this photo. This is the place where my field site is right now. This area, this watery area is my field site now. And this is the, nine, uh, the 2001 um, Google map of uh, Baseco. Oh no, I'm with geographers. I'm, I'm quite scared that I'm showing these maps, but please bear with me. Not a geographer, I'm, I'm an anthropologist. So this is the best map I could get. I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly hearing Sir Joseph saying to me, I hope you have a better map, but yeah. So here is um, here is um, Baseco compound in 2001. You would notice that the watery area suddenly now has a, had this. This are the houses built, and um, these houses were built by the family members of the workers of the shipyard. You see, back in the 1960s, um, uh, this area was bought by a um, a um, a friend of the Marcuses, and it was um, it was made into a shipyard, and um, the well the the, econo the the livelihood in this area grew, and so workers came in, and um, based on the demographic survey that my students and I did in this area, majority of the of the people living in this area are actually migrants. So it, it's quite interesting if a geographer would come in here and do some work here, because one thing that you would notice is that the blocks are divided by ethnic origins. So, um, for example, one of the blocks there that is solid, solid in terms of um, uh, where they came from and the cultural heritage they had is called Block Nine. So they have their own mosque and they are um, they uh, they live um, quite exclusive from the other blocks. Uh, so we have a block full of Visayans. We have a block full of you know every province that they, they kind of group together of some sort and um, uh, populated uh, a block of Baseco. So there are about um, there are about 19 or so blocks. I'm sorry if I'm mis uh, mistaking my numbers there, but um, uh, I work primarily in Aplaya. So Aplaya is um, this part. So there. So Aplaya is um, right here in um, right here. Uh, sorry, right here. <laughs> Right here. So we we um, the Aplaya naturally, as we as Filipinos would know, this is the um, this is the shore of Baseco. So it faces um, majority of the Aplaya faces Manila Bay, and so the Pasig River is um, right here. So Pasig River is right here. That is now uh, it it now has a wider road because it's being developed in relation to the Pearl of. Um, Pearl of Manila, if, if you guys have heard about that, the development of a more like a, a resort casino uh, in front of, uh, right in Manila Bay. So they have been developing this, this area for that. So you notice that in 2017, it's already full of people. So there are about, um, based on their 2001, uh, 2020 um, um, census, they have about 64,000 plus uh, residents now in Baseco. And you have to remember that the that Baseco has a fluid um, population, fluid in the sense that people keep on coming and going. So there are people there who have been living there since the 1960s, pass it on to their grandchildren and, su and such. But um, some of the people there are really um, uh, fluid residents. So they come there for specific times of the year, um, sometimes during election, sometimes during periods of celebration. So it's a fluid society. And um, recent development in the area that I'm really monitoring and quite worried about is the, the, is the, um, is the establishment of concrete houses. So the houses in Baseco, oh, that's my fault now. I forgot to put a picture of that. So uh, the houses in Baseco are made of light materials, mostly recycled materials. And re of recent years, I'm talking about five years or so, I've noticed that um, outsiders are buying the Aplaya land. 
So uh, you see there's no title to the lands here. All of the people here are informal settlers. Not a single one has a title to their land. So there's a reason why later on I will discuss there are so many issues in this area. That's why they're continuously vulnerable. So what I'm saying now is that um, the Aplaya area has lands that um, has lands that have that are being purchased by outsiders. What are they purchasing? The residential number. Uh, so the Barangay Hall um, gave them gave them uh, the original settlers that they call. Uh, they gave them something like a residential number, and those residential numbers prove that you are somehow a resident of Baseco, that you're a legitimate resident of Baseco, even if you don't own the title. So I think this is what we call the rights uh, of the land. So. Um, I uh, one of my um, collaborators in Baseco, the, the neighbor has a two story house, a two, two story house, concrete house, um, a car, and it kind of really skews you with your with your reality once you, you go to the place and, and compare and contrast the house of your collaborator and the, the neighbor who, who uh, kind of uh, just migrated there uh, two years ago. And you would see the stark difference. They have water, they have electricity, and my collaborator has none of those. So it's, it's a very interesting um, development right now in the area. But I am not here to discuss that kind of development in the area. I'm here to discuss more about the foodscape. The reason why I'm discussing all of this is because I would like as early as now to frame the discussion about vulnerability and uh, about um, the structural inequity that they have. And this is something that really affects how they imagine food. So Basaka compound, uh, if you grow up in Basaka compound, you should be already pretty much aware of the hazards that are in the area. You grow up not not feeling too vulnerable with the hazards as, as um, the children that I have interviewed um, mentioned. So I, I wrote a paper on um, flooding and the children's narratives of this. They did not see it as a threat to their life. They did not see it as a threat to their well-being. Um, this photo is one of my favorite photo in, not, in the sense that I took it uh, sometime in 2012. Um, there was a typhoon and um, these kids were asking me to swim with them. And of course I wouldn't do that out of fear for my life, but these kids were having the best time of their lives. I asked them, um, I was screaming because you know, the waves and all that. I asked them, aren't you afraid? Shouldn't you go home? And then they said, no, it's fun. Come on, join us. And of course I wouldn't join them. Um, these things that you're seeing are the piles of garbage that um, are typically there. But um, yeah, so typically there. So they've been living with hazards for the longest time. Um, older adults now have lived with these hazards, flooding, fire, and diseases. And that's the reason why um, in this pandemic, I also talked about this with Ateneo at one point, I discussed how the pandemic has further um, ostracized and marginalized them because the idea is that people from informal settlements like this or some altered communities are this, are the super spreaders of the pandemic. So um, there is the geography of blame that Paul Farmer would typically uh, use in his works. And that, that, that blame, uh, blaming stance have been cast on them again. So these children, the adults, everybody who have been in Paseco have lived with hazards all their lives. And so when there's, um, when there's flooding, I am the one who panics. I'm the one who tells them, you should evacuate. And my collaborator, collaborators would tell me, uh, not yet, just relax, we're okay. And I asked them, how deep is the flood anyway? And they would say, oh, it's just by the uh, level of your thigh, so it's fine, we'll, we'll evacuate later later and they don't so they actually don't and i got tired eventually asking them to um uh, evacuate and soon enough it's um it's quite um a reality already that um their idea of hazards their idea of disaster has been totally reframed by their lived experiences um in this area so that being said 
the point of this paper. The point of this paper, uh, not paper rather, but this discussion is about foodscape. Uh, I was very interested to see how uh, you've entered uh, your key concepts about foodscape. I saw that there was hunger. Uh, I saw that there was a scarcity of resources and such things. How, how do we define foodscape? So I've highlighted here a phrase from this definition. And um, I like this, uh, I subscribe to this idea of making meaning or meaning making about food. Foodscape is a combination of how people are intersecting with their environment as they make meaning and as they consume food. And so um, this, this resonates a lot with, um, with most of us uh, in the sense that um, our regions would have their you know, would have their own delicacies that we say this represents my 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 province or whatnot. And when you ask people from Baseco, um, what would represent what food would represent them? I think um, this uh, picture that you're seeing, taken by my good friends uh, Yako and Peter, um, this is what is a saving grace for a lot of them during periods of hunger. This is tahong. So um, that's why tahong is quite, or uh, tahong mussels are quite um, uh, a touchy topic for me because this is, I've seen a lot of kids uh, dive for this. I've seen a lot of kids, um, even older adults, try to um, survive their hunger by um, uh, gathering this, collecting this. and. Um, how, how, do, how do they define the foodscape of Baseco? Today, I'm going to discuss three ways by which they gather their food and how do they make meaning about, the, um, about this food. So these are the three food, food sources in Baseco. And yes, I've eaten all of them. Um, one thing about being an ethnographer is that you cannot escape participating in a community. So I think the most difficult uh, food I've eaten in my life would have been pug pug. Um, I've um, I would be discussing that in a while now. So there are three ways that um, people um, collect food, and there are three. I'm sorry, not three ways, but there are three food groups that are um, that are collected in Baseco. One would be a, um, a food group that is collected from personal networks. There would be a food group collected uh, from the estuary. And then of course the food group collected from waste bins. I'd like to start with the personal food network. Why? Because I think this is the less difficult point of conversation. So um, the, the food networks in Baseco is quite interesting because there you have um, kin-based food groups. Um, when I say kin-based food groups, I'm talking about um, sharing protocols, food sharing networks that are based on kinship. So mostly these are um, extended relatives who are sharing uh, their food uh, sources and I've no I've, I've documented one of my key informants for my dissertation um, was sharing food with about three um, households extended relatives so whoever has food will have to share it with other um, family members even if it's just rice you have to share it with the other family um, family I'm sorry uh, all, the, all the other three households. And then there's also food loans. As you could see in this picture, it's a Sari Sari store. So yeah, food loans are complex because it's um, based on social capital, right? Uh, so immediately those, um, those people who have um, known relatives, uh, I'm sorry, who have relatives who are known to have work are allowed um, some food loans. Those who don't have any source of livelihood are naturally um, not given food loans. And this is quite um, um, heavily, this heavily affects older adults um, because in most cases in Baseco, um, older adults are living independently. Um, uh, when I say independently, I'm, I'm saying that this, there, there is a there was a phenomenon of a missing second generation in Baseco. I'm talking about you're having a grandparents, uh, so grandparents and the, the children of this are missing. So we have the grandchildren and somehow the grandparents are caring for the grandchildren. We have a phenomenon of that in Baseco. And with that, um, 
the older adults are technically living independently because they have to economically provide for these children. They also have to um, care for these children. So if they are uh, living independently, they wouldn't have any other sources of income. And that would mean they would not have any credit in any um, Sari Sari store. So um, there is a big issue about age and access to food loan arrangements. And so where do older adults, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot about older adults because that is the focus of my, my, of my work, but where do older adults, for example, get their food supplies? Um, usually it's from food related services, such as what you can see in this um, bigger photo. Um, this is a group of women, the Maseko Women's Association um, that I am part of. And um, they connect with NGOs they connect with universities and gather resources that they could distribute to most food insecure households. And that would mostly be older adult households. There is also what, um, um, there is also um, this type of food related service. And you might say, no, I know that. That's called Pagbabawang and it's a livelihood. Yes, but at the same time, um, they are, uh, this one intersects with food related service and food loan. Why? Because in some cases, um, for example, in this situation, the, the, the earnings of this, which is about 70 pesos per day for one sack of um, garlic uh, that you have to peel, the 70 pesos could be loaned from them. Okay, so they, they could loan it um, from them. Um, and uh, I think the, the term that they use sometimes would be bungo. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that term, but they sometimes say ibubunggo uh, komuna yung kita ko sa bawang. So they, they would like um, for um, tell them that I have about 70 pesos to earn today. So will you lend me, you know, a, a kilo of rice and such? And this is also related. Uh, this is also connected to food related services because in some contexts, um, in there are some NGOs that. Um, uh, provide services, I mean, provide opportunities like this in exchange for food, um, like food supply. There's also um, other types of livelihood, like, uh, like weaving and such that would be um, exchanged for food supply. So this is the, the version that is, um, that I would call easier to discuss, um, because it's, um, it's less heart wrenching. It, it is difficult, but it's, less difficult to discuss uh, compared to, let's say, um, uh, eating recycled food. So th this is the first method of food um, sourcing in Baseco. And what are the types of food that you get here? Usually canned goods. So that's what you're going to get from doing this. Typically, you're going to get canned goods because Sari Sari stores don't sell fresh food. So you're going to get canned goods, rice, noodles, um, uh, I've witnessed so many times that a family of seven would share a a pack of um, a pack of um, a pack of noodles. They will dilute that and share it more like as a soup. So they could loan that from here. Coffee could be loaned. In short, are they loaning nutritious food? The answer is no. Most of the time, these are um, pre-packed um, food, and um, so. Do they have access to fresh market? Some of them do, but I've not documented a lot of um, uh, fresh food suppliers that would allow for loans, food loans. Most of the time, it's the Sari Sari store. The next part, uh, which is quite um, wonderful. Oh, the pictures being shown here all have permissions. These are my collaborators from Baseco. One time, remember during the ECQ period, where in, uh, wherein we were all stuck in our houses and they were not allowed to get out of Baseco. Can you imagine the impact of that to a group of people who survived in collecting food from Divisoria um, uh, or collecting food somewhere else? Um, it, it was a nightmare. Why? You cannot plant in Baseco because it's a reclaimed land. It's We tried it. We tried urban gardening. It did not work. Um, plus, you try urban gardening, the floods come in, 
all the plants are gone. So it doesn't work that way. So uh, one time uh, they were t they were telling me, uh, "Ma'am, magpunta na kami sa dagat." <laughs> so they took pictures because um, they wanted to share it with me. So they went to this um, to Manila Bay, and these are the things that they caught during that day. Um, and this is the pre uh, this is Ati Marie. She's the president of the Baseco Women's Association, and um, uh, they collected all of this. And wh why why is this? Um, should we celebrate this as form of resilience? At a at a, um, in one glance, you would say yes because look at them. They're trying to you know fight off hunger and uh, look like it looks like they're enjoying it. I I question that all the time. I question that that motivation to discuss things um, in in that um, rosy colored idea of resilience because for me this is an outright manifestation of the refusal of the state to address hunger among the most vulnerable. People, uh, when I show this picture to people, they would say, oh, they're eating crabs, that's so expensive. Yes, that, that also came from Pasig River, Manila Bay. Are you gonna really eat that? So is this really resilience or is this just the state deciding you should take care of yourself because we're hands off. So this is this is something about foodscapes that we should always question. It, on picture, it looks nice. That's why I love showing this photo. I keep on asking my collaborators, I'd be showing this a lot. I love showing this because it looks like they're happy. It looks like everything is good, but it, it camouflages that big issue of food insecurity in the area. You wouldn't eat this if, if you know how toxic these waters are. And there should have been an option apart from this, going hungry and trying to uh, survive like this. So another point about this estuary that's very interesting is Whenever there's flooding, so initially in my first experience of flood there, which is what which was wasty, I was freaking out because I've never been in that kind of flood. Well, except for USD. But the point is, in that area, there was that time there was this flooding, and I was being told that it's a moment of rejoicing, primarily because flooding brings about a lot of food. Uh, so we're talking about bangus. So there there will be a lot of food uh, that will be coming from. Um, fish pens. Uh, so there will be fish pens that would overflow during periods of flooding and somehow because of the tributaries of the water, it would go uh, to Baseco area. And so they would be collecting a lot of um, uh, big fishes and um, they consider flooding as a blessing of some sort because it brings about not just this type of food, but other materials that could be collected such as scrap material. Okay, let me move on from this. Now, let me go to a rather um, difficult discussion. And um, this is my uh, first key informant in the area. His name is Papai. Um, he was the first person that I followed around like a dog. <laughs> you know how ethnographers are, right? So they, they follow around this key informant all the time. So I, I was that for Papa. I, I followed him uh, for a year. He taught me how to uh, collect pagpag. -pag. So right here, what you're seeing is pagpag. -pag. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with pagpag, -pag, it's recycled uh, food. That's the nice version of saying it. But the more brutal way of saying it is that these are the food that you did not finish eating in your Jollibee or wh whichever place that you go to, and they throw it, right? So people like Popeye, uh, would collect it um, in the midnight um, by, by the time that the, the establishments are closing. So he would collect it and there will be, um, there will be classes of uh, pag -pag, like class A to class D and it will be priced differently. So I did, um, <laughs> I did um, shadow him for, for some time doing that. And I've learned a lot on how they navigate um, these areas in Manila, how turfing happens uh, among pag, -pag collectors. And uh, one thing that um, Papa uh, taught me and that, that became the uh, center of all my discussion about food insecurity is that food 
security is a nuanced um, idea or a nuanced concept. We cannot, um, for him, we cannot just have a box type definition of food security because our lived experiences um, define our understanding of what food um, is acceptable and what food is not acceptable. And right here, it was a, uh, this is not a, a picture that I took. It was from one of my collaborators and um, Popeye here was distributing um, his collected pag pag. And um, this is, this is the area where um, there is a polarization of feelings about um, polarized feelings about pag pag. A group of people here would say that uh, this is something you shouldn't do because um, this is like the lowest rung of of all experiences of food security. But for Papa, it, it's not supposed to be seen as that because he said, "Should I?" He asked me one time, "Should I feed my grandchildren?" Um, that uh, inasal, <laughs> I'll show you the inasal, um, this one, hang on. He asked me, should I feed my grandchildren inasal? This one, uh, have you tasted this? I ate all of this <laughs> when, I, when I was there. Um, we would joke sometimes like, what, what do you want to eat for lunch? Uh, do you want lumpia or inasal or pangus? And um, we, we would eat this and he said he would rather feed his um, grandchildren real food than this because he would say this food doesn't have any nutrition, nutritional value to, to it, to them. So he said, if I feed them pag pag, which is mostly chicken, and if I feed them pag pag, I cook it adobo or I, I cook it with vegetables, my grandchildren will be um, healthier than those who eat um, this. Uh, he, he said, this chicheria. So this, uh, this, creates a, um, a nuanced uh, concept of um, food security because our traditional definition of food security is that it should be healthy, it should be, um, uh, yeah, so it should be healthy, it should be nutritious, it should be accessible. And there's another part there that it should be culturally acceptable, but they kind of redefined it as um, aligned with food preferences. So it must be culturally um, acceptable. And the question now is, how do we define food security in a subaltern community wherein the foodscape only provides you with three major sources, the garbage bin, the polluted waters, and the, the micro stores that would give you food like lumpia in a salad bangus. How do you define food insecurity in these areas? And so we have to um, make a we have to embrace a more nuanced understanding of food security. We have to consider how um, the foodscape defines a person's understanding of food security. For Popeye and the women who were buying this, uh, I, I, I realized that food security is about providing your family members with real food. Will during Papa's time would he go to Manila Bay to catch some um, some seafood? Yes, but the problem is that not everyone can access that. Why you would need to have a boat, and so it's quite dangerous um, if you're also not uh, able to swim. Some older adults drown trying to collect the home. So the vulnerability posed by the estuary in food collection is higher compared to going around um, garbage bins and collecting food. Now, as I try to close this discussion, I was told I have 30 minutes. Sorry if I kind of um, uh, extended a bit. How, how do we frame um, food security? How do we frame the foodscape, this subaltern foodscape of Baseco? I'd like to frame it uh, in the context of um, political economy and uh, a localized, I mean, um, um, a local political economy context such that um, you must wonder at some point, why are the residents of Baseco still not able to access basic services like water, like toilet, like drainage, 
like good housing why are they not allowed that and why are uh, if why are why is the government keeping them in that dangerous area without any plan for um without any plan to resolve the issues relating to their quality of life. And you must say that's not true because um, uh, the mayor of Manila, uh, Yorme, actually built um, uh, sus sustainable housing for them. And the problem is that that housing is number one, inaccessible to most of the residents of Basaiko. That's number one. Number two is that that housing remains vulnerable to the hazards of, of the area. We have to remember it is a reclamation area. Number three, people who were able to access that have to pay for that for almost the rest of their lives. Are they able to do that? Can, the, can people like Popeye pay for that kind of housing? I lived with Popeye um, on and off during my uh, field work and his house is no bigger than a um, five, uh, seven square meter of a space. That's where he lived, that's where he cooked, that, that is where he packed his food that he would sell, that is where his grandchildren would sleep, that is where I would sleep sitting down. And so how, how do we make sense of all of this? And the way that you have to uh, locate this issue is by seeing this new development that is going on in Manila Bay. When you have Dolomite Beach coming in, when you have the Pearl of Manila or Pearl of whatever that is being established in that area, when you have the golf courses of Intramuros just smacking you in the face with all of this hunger, with all of this poverty going on, with all this blaming going on should we not should we be um not curious or not critical of how the state is framing our issue of hunger we have to look into how the state has been say, um, framing subaltern communities from blaming them for deforestation, from highlighting their resilience whenever, uh, the, the, whenever they're struck with hazards. Um, this, this framing of our informal settlers as both the culprit of their situation and at the same time, the group of people responsible for their own survival. Th this framing is so marginalizing. It is um, dehumanizing. The people that struggle, just uh, the people who struggle for survival uh, within the city. Again, uh, I keep on saying this in all of my talks. Who really has the right to the city? Why do we? Why is it that only a few people have the right to the city? And why is it that when people like the people of Baseco Compound come into the city, they're blamed for polluting the city? They're blamed for uh, a whole lot of tragedies in the city without the state even coming in to address the situation that is uneven development. So using the foodscape discussion, I'm sorry I um, took a while, but using the discussion on foodscape, I, I have hoped that I was able to um, give a more nuanced discussion on not just food security, because that's just a bouncing area for this idea, but not just on food security, but I, I hope that I provided a more nuanced discussion of urban living, uh, of urban rights and justice. All right, that should be all. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alejandri. I must say that the discussion brought in a lot of um, insights uh, on the range of topics related to um, or related to the assemblage of hazards, health, and uh, in relation to foodscapes. And it also resonates to my MS thesis. Since you talked about right in the city and disasters, um, I just remembered some of my findings there, for example. Um, 
in a, this is in, in the context of a very urban community in Rizal, wherein um, they are using DRR as a way to challenge the, the absence of the state in terms of uh, DRR uh, in their area, considering that they are vulnerable to hazards. And then since they feel being neglected by the state, so the grassroots actions would um, take effect uh, as, as a way to challenge or counter the, 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 the notion or, and also there is these unequal developments in their area, which is also uh, happening. And it, I'm also happy that this resonates with uh, your presentation this afternoon. And I'm sure that there are a lot of questions, reactions and comments coming from our audience. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so I think um, Um, we should go now to um, our open forum. So please type in your questions, um, your comments or reactions to the presentation of Dr. Alejandria. I think we have uh, a couple of questions already in our, um, I am seeing right now in the document. Okay, so let us start with this one. Um, this is very, very interesting. Um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation how the population of the community is fluid. This is coming from um, one of my colleagues in EGS, uh, Ma'am Celes Hermida. She said, um, you mentioned earlier about how the population of the community is fluid. How does this transitory nature affect how they secure food? Uh, she also wonders if they can be likened to seasonal migrants who follow seasonal patterns like how the nomadic populations of West Asia and North Africa would move away from for some time during the dry season and they move back to the desert during the rainy season. Do, 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 do these people, do they, do they follow a season? I think you're on good uh, <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> I, just, I just answered your question without, with my mic off. Um, but that is such a great question. You know, this is a this is actually a project that I was hoping to do. Somebody should really do it. Um, I don't have um, concrete data on their migratory patterns. It, these are more like um, um, anecdotal anecdotal evidences that um, have been shared, and we have witnessed as a team. And I would really hope to I would really hope someone to do a, a study on this because that will be very uh, important. But for the anecdotes that uh, I have so far, um, the the migration of people are related to conflicts. So, uh, so it's it's a typical um, story of there are relatives in Manila that you can stay with in turn in in periods of conflict. So remember the time that we had the Marawi siege. I'm I'm gonna specifically uh, point to that direction. So when we had the Marawi siege, I was noticing that there were too many um, uh, Muslim um, Muslim. Uh, groups coming in into into the area and I, I i asked some some friends of mine from block nine which i earlier mentioned right that that's like the the area for them so i asked them um are there new people coming in uh, it feels like there there are just so many people coming in and they said yes these are some of the people from marawi who went here because there's a going on crisis there so i i realized that when oh, okay so it could be possible that the that when there's a conflict in one area people um people seek out relatives in manila where they could rebuild their lives and i was and this is super anecdotal i have like two stories of hayan that they migrated to baseco after hayan so there are some periods of disaster that push or bring people to baseco compound I am not just so sure about the other motivations. The other stories are not necessarily nice because it's about hiding from police officers because of some crimes that they've done somewhere and Basek would be a good place to hide, something like that. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Elihelgi. And this is actually a comment from one of the members of our audience. Uh, so this uh, the comment goes, I'd like to commend this presentation for showing us how stimulating face-to-face -face field ethnography is. I also like the fact that uh, how you grounded and situated your area geographically rather than focus on objection. This wonderful documentation and ethnographic snapshot of Paseco did away with polemics and instead showed vivid lives of the residents. 
this perspective is like a front seat, uh, front seat view of the area many of us have not visited. Finally, um, I, he would, uh, the person would like to say that you also deconstructed common definitions of concepts like um, food security and resilience. So thank you for this presentation. Would you like to address this uh, comment? Uh, okay. Wow, uh, thank you for the person who mentioned that. I'm pretty sure uh, Professor Mary Rosellis would be very happy to hear that somebody appreciated my ethnographic work. Um, footnote, I am not the first anthropologist who did work in this area. Uh, Professor Mary Rosellis was, was the uh, first person to document Maseko. And what's so beautiful about ethnography is that you can never say, how come uh, Mary Rosella said this about Maseko and you're saying a totally different story? Because that's the beauty of ethnography. It's just a slice of the present that you can present. Uh, some of you may do ethnography in Maseko someday and your data may be totally different from mine and that's going to be okay. We, we just represent this, that slice of present. But thank you so much. All right, thank you so much for that, uh, Ma'am Karine. Um, in connection to resilience, uh, I would like to ask this question um, since uh, the person who commented earlier brought, about, uh, brought in resilience. In your, in your work in Baseco, have you asked people like how they actually define the word resilient? How do they see themselves as resilient if you have any chance um, asking them what resilience means to them or how they build resilience in the face of state neglect, for example, um, on that aspect. All right. Um, I, I did a minimal, minimal collaboration with uh, Harvard Humanitarian Institute. Um, they, um, I brought uh, their uh, director in the field because they were trying to see uh, the concepts of resilience. And uh, he did ask that question to the women's group and uh, they cannot answer him because the, the concept of resilience is too foreign to them. Um, it, it was just too foreign. And, and uh, I was being asked like to translate it to Filipino, but how do we really translate this? Like, is there a unit unified understanding of resilience and I've asked my Filipino um, uh, uh, what call them Filipino teachers um, uh, experts about this and they have different ways of discussing resilience as well so for, for the Baseco people um, the, the residents of Baseco resilience is just about at least this is how I understood what they were telling me resilience is all about just surviving because you're supposed to survive on your own. You cannot trust the state to provide for you. And that's and there, if there is a flooding, they don't call the LGU and say, oh, by the way, we have flooding here. They don't do that. They just do they, what they call as bayanihan, what we call as bayanihan. So ladies and, and men would, would uh, dig uh, so they would keep on digging um, um, canals just to make sure that the water would go back to the sea. So they're pretty much on their own. That's that's their feeling, and uh, it would it reflects on how they would also vote. If I may push that envelope, they feel like they've been isolated by the government for the longest period of time, and so whoever shows up with more structural. Um, structural projects in the area become the primary person for voting. The, um, so uh, because of the concept of memory. So even if you get, this is going to be a little bit of a shade, but even if you just give them toilets, when I say toilet, I'm, ta I'm just talking about the ceramic toilet. You don't even give them the plumbing for that. You just give them toilets. They will remember you because somehow you show that I was there, I heard you of some sort because they've been marginalized for quite too long. And you would see that in the way that they vote. Thank you so much for that. Um, that also resonates with the work that I did in the Peric Urban Community in Rizal, where in, um, they have this, um, they have this, what they call adaptive resilience. They, they claim that they have an adaptive resilience where in, in the face of climate change, in the face of um, what you call that um, intense rainfall, and it brought it, it brings about um, uh, intense flash floods in their area. They have this grassroots community that a grassroots action that they did 
in the face of state neglect and all that. So that really resonates with what I did in um, that community. See, here, anyway. here, yeah. if, I can, if I can add to that, that's a beautiful concept of adaptive resilience because these foodscapes are not year long. I'd like to emphasize that. It's not year long. So th there's like a shift in how they manage these foodscapes. For, for example, as I've mentioned, they would only go for um, tahong or uh, for the products of the estuary when, um, for example, when they cannot go out of, of Baseco because it's easier to just go to Divisoria. That's, that's one of the food sources that I did not discuss here anymore, but they would go to Divisoria. And you know that in Divisoria, right, that they have like um, vegetables there that they cut, they call it retaso. So yes, yes. just to make sure that they look fresh, right? So they throw yeah. some parts of the vegetables and what um, some members of the community would do is that they would <clears throat> collect them and then bring them home. And that's what they cook at the same time, sell. So that's, yes. a, that's a typical source of food, but because of the uh, pandemic that become that that got eroded and so they had to redefine their foodscape and now go to the sea go to other contexts even the pug, pug collection became problematic so the pandemic hit the foodscape and that's something that i'm exploring in the paper because the traditional food sources for retaso and pug, pug were closed because of the quarantine so now they have to really rely on what the estuary is giving them Thank you so much for that, ma'am. Okay, this is a question coming from Brian, who's working on his master's thesis with on pagpag and food insecurity. So this would oh. be a good question to ask. Uh, would you like just he would just want to know why you chose your title of your talk as situating hunger instead of situating food insecurity, given that the latter is more indicative of the country's social economic gaps or inequalities. Just wondering, since Baseco is a clearly neglected subaltern. Uh, community in reference to the rest of Metro Manila, meaning they are lower on the social class and unfortunately estranged within the lo local political economy. Also, very much appreciate your topic. No, Brian, we should talk sometime. Please uh, find me in, in Messenger. Uh, let's talk. This is, this is going to be a good collaboration. But thank you for pointing that out. The reason why I, I chose hunger is because um, I, I was actually, I was actually against myself in using hunger. I wanted to use food insecurity, but it's quite, um, it's quite, uh, it's out of convenience that I used hunger. In fact, if I should really be true to my own project, to my own um, findings, I shouldn't even use hunger. I should be using kalam. So. Um, because in my in my work, it wasn't gutom that was the peak of, of food insecurity. It was kalam because gutom is a constant. So Brian, that I'm sorry that uh, I agree with you, totally agree with you. But I just use hunger for convenience because I'm hoping that I will be able to discuss that in in uh, in my presentation. But if I, as again, if I would be true to my um, to my data, I would not even use hunger or gutom. I would definitely use kalam because according to my key informants, hunger is a constant day-to-day -day experience. So it, it's not even hunger anymore. Um, for them, um, it's not even food insecurity anymore. For them, food insecurity was a concept of kalam, which is a worse version of hunger. And for them, they, they define that as not having eaten for a whole day and having had drank just a, hot, a cup of hot water or so. Uh, thank you very much for that, ma'am. No? Um, I think this is one of the... Okay, so there's, this, there's another question from our um, chat box uh, from Jomel. He said, hello po, um, since the residents are fluid, I wonder what the process of socialization look like for you residents. Also, how universal or common is the use of pagpag in the compound? How do new res residents adapt or adjust to their new place? Uh. Uh, as a person who became a new resident in the area, um, your uh, socialization would happen uh, by, uh, by kin-based naturally. So if you're asking like, where do you get your information and what blocks not to cross, um, that would definitely come from your uh, kids, from your family members. I, I realized <laughs> this is one of our um, favorite 
um, memory lane talk among my uh, my, my students. Uh, one time, uh, I remember crossing a boundary in Baseco, and you have to understand, there's there's no clear boundary there, right? It's packed houses, and somehow you're just supposed to know that this is already block nine or block whatever. I remember crossing one of the boundaries and got. Um, intimidated because there were people with um, firearms in that area and um, that that was quite uh, daunting for me to face because um, I was coming from a playa where people are naturally just funny and friendly <laughs> and then I crossed the line and apparently I got into that area so where do I where do you get your information from that just the host for me it, it was my collaborator who told me you were not supposed to go there remember this house and when you cross this house that's not a safe zone anymore uh, so th there are those discussions and um if uh, about pag -pag, it's not universally uh, consumed in the area because there's stigma even there's still stigma even in that area about pag -pag. and um th the thing is that um it's quite hard to locate because I tried doing that. Like, is it about gender that creates the stigma? Is it about the age that creates the stigma? But I realized that eating pag pag is more acceptable for homes wherein there is an older adult and grandchildren who are living um, alone without any support. So grandparents have decided to feed their grandchildren that. So that's what I have observed. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think this is the last question uh, for for this open forum. Um, this is coming from me. Um, you mentioned earlier in your discussion uh, of the Baseco maps that um, there are blocks that are divided based on the people's ethnic origin. So is that really a conscious effort on the part of the inhabitants in the community? Or is this somehow um, organic already? But it just emerged na um get it get it get it division at then or uh this is intention that on their part right uh i think it's organic um wait hang on because when you migrate to manila to baseco naturally you will stay with your kids right so i, I suppose it's intentional but at the same time um it becomes a bit more organic knowing that, for example, your mosque is located in, in block nine. So naturally you will gravitate towards that mosque, all right? So um, it, it's hard to really uh, give you a definite answer on that because I don't have data on that. Um, but definitely for, um, I'd like to highlight at this point of discussion that Baseco the demography of Baseco is drastically changing, as I mentioned earlier. There are already people with um, pickup trucks parked uh, in a playa. I'm really getting confused how that happens um, when uh, the rest of the population are hungry and then there are now um, two-story houses with cable and internet. I, I'm, I'm super confused, but I'm happy. The reason, uh, just a segue point to this, the reason why I'm happy that the, my collaborator has a neighbor with two-story house and electricity and whatnot is because that neighbor has internet and my collaborator gets to uh, have internet. So now I can communicate with my collaborator um, with more ease because we can do messenger because there's internet. Well, that's all for now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alejandria, for sharing your time with us. And I also wish to thank our audience for their active participation in our discussion. Uh, this is very fruitful and very exciting to see the future of this um, uh, research topic. And we hope that we, uh, we could collaborate uh, in the future. Anyway, to, to show our appreciation, the Philippine Geographical Society would present this certificate to our speaker. The Certificate of Appreciation is given to Maria Carines Alejandria for the valuable insights and expertise shared as a virtual resource speaker for the talk Charting Some Altered Foodscapes, Situating hung Hunger in an Estuary Community as part of the Philippine Geographical Society Lecture Series 2022, held on March 18, 2022, signed by Professor Joseph Palis. Chair of the Department of Geography of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. 
and uh, Professor Emmanuel Garcia, President of the Philippine Geographical Society. So once again, thank you very much, Dr. Alejandria, for being with us tonight. Uh, we hope to have you again in the future. So thank you very much again. That's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much. And with that, um, we are now gearing towards the end of the, our program. I would like to call on Professor Joseph Palis, Chair of the UP Department of Geography and our convener of the PGS Lecture Series. Thank you very much, uh, TJ, and thank you very much, Karin. So rich, so vivid, and so wonderfully told. I'm a big fan of, uh, of stories and narratives in, in field ethnography, and yours just did that. And, and if I may, if you will allow this little indulgence on my part, I did remember that, that, that when you defended your dissertation, that's exactly what many of us panelists mentioned as, as one of the strongest points is that you are an absolutely A-plus anthropologist. So thank you for giving us uh, that opportunity in this, in this presentation. I do want to say something about this uh, talk. Um, the one thing I like about this presentation also was because of its, um, uh, uh, like the question earlier or comment earlier about the deconstruction of certain concepts about resilience, food security, and others. Um, it seems to point to the fact that this is such a very, it, it comes from a place of being a witness and being a participant, and also being in the area with uh, living with people in their own experiences. And that speaks so much about how the understanding uh, extends towards textbook definitions of, of those concepts you mentioned. And if I may use this platform to actually also sort of address what Brian mentioned and, and what what uh, Karin uh, um, answered about regarding food security. Many years ago, my master's thesis was about uh, food security also, uh, but it's focused on rice uh, in Iloilo, uh, where I came from. And, um, and, and just sort of to kind of maybe, I, I don't know if this is a kind of uh, defense for why, to me, I would prefer hunger than, than food security as a title, is because food security has been hijacked by a much more there's a, a much bigger political, geographic, sociological definition that has hijacked the meaning to become only shortage of food or unsustainability of food towards people. But, but hunger sometimes um, seemed to capture what was in there. I'm not familiar with the word kalam before. Gutom, yes, absolutely. But I think in a sense, hunger is when people just say, I don't know the word of food security, but I just know one thing. It's, it's hunger. And it brings to my mind what George Orwell once said in his book, 1984, when my, one of the characters said something that when you are in pain, you just want it to go away and not to theorize it. So that's when I think one of the, the beauty of, of listening to this kind of pre presentation because it, 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 it lovingly, if fiercely, locates uh, those kinds of stories front and center to give a meaning to the words that we take for granted. So thank you very much for this presentation, Karin. Uh, totally uh, 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 wonderful and lived in. So, so I go to the next slide, I guess. <laughs> there is going to be a talk that's coming up on March 28, 10 days after this talk by Adam Yulu from Igdir University in Turkey. He's going to talk about the case of Mount Ararat, mountain tourism. And then in April, we're going to have one of our own PGS members, Kathy Angela Illustre, who's going to, from Geodata, who's going to also talk um, uh, about geospatial technology. And, and we have some lineups in May as well. So, so that, that's, that those are coming up. And I guess that, oh, yeah, you can be members of the Philippine Geographical Society. Um, go to our website, psgeographicalsociety.org, and you'll find details there. Um, membership is on a rolling basis. Thank you yes. very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Professor Palis. Also, if you want to revisit the past sessions of our uh, PGS lecture series, these can be found in the UP Dep Department of Geography YouTube channel. So you may check uh, these out, including this uh, session uh, tonight. 